ओके गुड मॉर्निंग सो वेलकम टू द इलेवेंथ एडिशन ऑफ ए पी जे कोलकाता लिटरेरी फेस्टिवल एंड इट इज़ अ न्यू डेकेट ऑफ लिटरेरी एक्सीलेंस द फर्स्ट इंटरनेशनल लिटरेरी फेस्टिवल इन कोलकाता एंड ईस्टर्न इंडिया ए के एल एफ अ नॉन प्रॉफिट इनिशिएटिव फ्री फॉर ऑल इज़ द ओनली लिटरेरी फेस्टिवल ऑर्गेनाइज बाई अ बुक स्टोर द आइकॉनिक सेंचुरी ओल्ड ऑक्सफर्ड बुक स्टोर ऑन पार्क स्ट्रीट एज वी एंटर अ न्यू डेकेट वी रेकग्नाइज द वर्ल्ड ऑफ द बुक a world of ideas and arguments empathy and analysis discussion and debate freedom of expression and multiple points of view is more relevant today perhaps than ever before so to begin the event at allen park we i would also like to tell you we have four venues today one is allen park the other one is max muller bhavan another one is oxford bookstore another one is allianz france so let me tell you i would request all of you to please clap uh, as i request both the directors uh, ms naina bhagat and ms anjum katyal to please come up on stage and to formally inaugurate the event which is uh, the 11th year of apj kolkata literary festival i request ma'am to please stay there and speak if uh, if you are if you can climb up on stage ma'am can be here thank you so much very good morning to all our friends well wishers book lovers i see so many wonderful faces in the audience it's a uh, it's a wonderful feeling to be here for the 11th edition of our festival which has completed 10 a decade of uh, offering the book lovers of the city something special at least we feel that way we work very hard for it our team works incessantly for it throughout the year and so here we are i prefer to speak from here and give the main stage to our very eminent um, uh, panelists who will arrive shortly and uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural event of the apj kolkata literary festival now in its 11th edition our pioneering city festival we were the first to start an english language festival in north uh, in eastern india is an outstanding bouquet of literary and cultural interactions especially curated to delight you and kolkata audiences are very discerning as we all know so they will expect only the best and we aim towards that it gives me great pleasure to welcome william if i knew where he was <laughs> so no i have to welcome him <laughs> let me join let me join maina in welcoming all of you here today uh, we are waiting for william last sighted at the park street crossing he shall no doubt be here sailing in we already have johar sarkar with us who uh, is going to be leading him through this discussion uh, just very quickly i just wanted to add a few words to what we've already heard our venues today uh, and through the festival include the max miller bhavan in park mansions just across the road the alliance francaise park mansions just across the road they've been great partners over several years and we are very thankful that we can continue to partner with them and we also have the iconic oxford bookstore which has its own uh, repertoire of events which will be unfolding over the next 3 days i uh, just wanted to say that uh, when one is the curator and director of a major festival in a major city one of the main questions and i see several festival directors sitting here and i know that they'll agree with me one of the main questions you face is how do you stay relevant you're doing a literary festival you've been doing it for over 10 years this is now the 11th year as uh, mrs bhagat says what keeps you relevant how do you stay relevant well one big answer for us is that we are growing out of a bookstore and there is nothing more relevant to the life of any city than a bookstore and an iconic bookstore like the oxford bookstore which is 100 years old and keeps going with thought for the mind thought for the soul that is at the core of this festival 
And out of that comes the festival programming, which is absolutely, as you will see if you look through the schedule, grounded in what is happening today all around us. How are we thinking about it? How are we responding to it? What are we doing about it? And hearing some of the most able and experienced people in our country address these issues. And in case you think it's all very dull and serious, we have some fun items as well. And we have a lot of emphasis on popular and younger fiction because we also want people to keep reading. So we want to bring in younger people who are looking for stuff that keeps them entertained and not always very heavy material. Having said that, I think we have now have a star performer who has reached us from the Park Street Crossing. A big round of applause, please. Um, uh, taking, Thank you. Uh, continuing from where I was and taking a lower seat and giving our eminent gentleman the stage, um, I'd like to, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome eminent writer and historian William Dalrymple and distinguished former secretary of the Ministry of Culture Jar Sarkar this morning. Gentlemen, we are honored and privileged to inaugurate AKLF 2020 with your discussion around Mr. Dalrymple's new book, Forgotten Masters, Indian Painting for the East India Company. The book celebrates the work of a series of extraordinary Indian artists who worked for their British patrons between 1770 and end of the Mughal rule. Calcutta, William, the city of your forebears, as you like to describe it, uh, welcomes you back. And uh, AKLF2, after your session with us in 2013, and your um, uh, book launch at the Oxford Bookstore of White Moguls. And um, uh, so it's been far too long. And please come as often as you come can to our city. I, a very warm welcome to my friend and chairperson of the APJ Surendra Group, Shireen Paul. Shireen, your being here makes a world of difference to us. And you know, it inspires the AKLF team to consistently climb to greater heights. It means a lot to us. Thank you for being with us from Delhi. On behalf of the APJ Kolkata Literary Festival and Oxford Bookstore, Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for being with us today. My co-director Anjum Katyal will present a brief overview of the festival program and the team looks forward to welcoming you to our literary sessions which are open access to all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here and enjoy the festival. Thank you. And just to say done and dusted, we're going straight into the festival now. No more introductions. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start with the first event. So everything has been said. I just want to mention one thing that we also have a timer. So sir and sir, we would request you to please adhere to the timer and make sure that we don't exceed our time. Till then, the stage is all yours. Can we have a big round of applause before they begin the event? Forty-five minutes. Very good. Could we have the next slide, please? Kind lady in the green sari. The first Indian word to enter the English language was the word... Sorry, the first Indian word to enter the English language was probably the word loot. <laughs> loot uh, was a Hindustani word... Uh, uh, common in North India, but unknown outside it until the mid-1750s, uh, when the word took mysterious hold and purchase uh, in uh, the British Isles. And to understand how this uh, foreign word 
came to be quite so common uh, in, uh, in Britain, particularly in England, one could do a lot worse than visit the uh, place on this slide here, which is Powys Castle, uh, into which the Clive family uh, married and where a lot of their loot ended up. Next slide. That very English facade gives way inside the turret to a surprisingly Indian interior because in the middle of the Welsh countryside on the Anglo-Welsh border with nice Jersey cows chewing the cud in the fields outside and pretty Tudor box hedges in the gardens below, you go upstairs and you find this extraordinary collection of talwars, shields, spears, elephant armor, chess pieces, ivory, Hindu statuary, next slide, uh, even some major pieces of uh, historical importance. This, we are looking through Siraj Dowla's palanquin, abandoned here on the battlefield of Plassey. And if you go through the arch at the end of this slide and into the room to the left, you end up uh, in uh, the campaign tent of Tipu Sultan. What is all this loot? There is more. Mughal loot in this room in Wales, in this series of rooms in Wales, than there is in any one collection uh, in India. What is this loot doing here? Next slide. Well, to understand how it got there, you could do a lot worse than study this picture, which is uh, leads into this kazana, this treasure chamber, uh, and uh, uh, depicts a Mughal prince in cloth of gold passing a document to a slightly overweight, uh, primped and periwigged uh, English gentleman. And this is Shah Alam passing the Diwani to Lord Clive. Now, the Diwani is not a word really that means anything to anyone either in Britain or uh, India today. Uh, but what it basically means is it's an act of involuntary privatization. And by handing over this document, Shah Alam was passing to a private British company not the British government, not 10 Downing Street, not the British Foreign Office, but to the East India Company, next slide, uh, which operated from this tiny building in the city of London, five windows wide. It's not even the two tall buildings on either side of this slide. It's just the five windows in the middle. And it, that document passed over to the directors of this company. Uh, and at the time of Plassey, when they were occupying in this building, there were still very little more than 35 employees in that building. Uh, uh, they passed over to those people the right to tax the three richest provinces of the Mughal Empire, which were Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. Now, today, one associates Calcutta with incredible culture, the best red people in India, the most beautiful women, best fish dishes, all sorts of wonderful things. But perhaps one thing one doesn't associate Bengal with so much today is extreme riches. But in 18th century India, Bengal was the richest area, not just of India, but in the world. The Bengal economy was powered by its one million weavers, particularly in Murshidabad and Dhaka, this, of course, is United Bengal, not just West Bengal, but the whole, the whole of Bengal. And um, these one million weavers were responsible for making the Mughal Empire, uh, from about 1750 onwards, the richest empire, sorry, from about 1650 onwards, the richest uh, state in the world. For the first time since the classical period, the first time since Ashoka, India overtook China as the center of the world's manufacturing, and Bengal was where the money was coming from, because Bengal had perfected not just uh, making the world's best quality but very cheaply produced cotton, but also uh, silks uh, and gorgeously, um, gorgeously decorative uh, mogul uh, uh, embroidery uh, 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 and other hangings which were used across Europe in, in, in Amsterdam, in Rome, in Venice, as well as London, Paris, and Lisbon uh, as the most desirable textiles in the world. Also, of course, from the Andhra coast came Kalamkaris uh, and so on. So Bengal then absolutely at the center of the world economy. 
And today when people talk about the moguls, particularly if it's the right talking about the moguls, if it's uh, our friends in, uh, uh, from the BJP uh, talking about the moguls, they tend to present them as these effete and, uh, and sort of slightly pathetic uh, sort of harem hoppers. Uh, in, in reality, everyone's looking the wrong place. The moguls turned the Indian economy into the richest economy in the world. And this was where it happens from. So that by seizing control of the economy at the Diwani, as Clive did in, uh, in 1665, uh, he pressed a switch that changed the history, not just of in India and Britain, but of Europe and Asia. Since the time of the Romans, money had been gushing out of Europe into India. Pliny complains that, uh, that, Roman, uh, that Roman women have developed a taste for expensive Indian diamonds, that they rub their body with Indian sandalwood, and they wear Indian silks, all of which was leading to a gush of Roman gold to this country. This continued at various degrees until 16, 1765, when, if you like, the switch changes. And suddenly, it's Indian gold and silver gushing towards Britain. If you want, when you go and visit Britain, you go to all those lovely National Trust houses that look as if Colin Firth has just uh, romped out of a pool in his breeches. Uh, where does the money for all that come? It comes from here, and the other half of it comes from the Caribbean slave trade, from uh, the plantations in Jamaica, Barbados, and so on. These two engines turned Britain from a relatively minor fringe European economy to the center of the world economy. It was your money going there that did it. And Clive pressed that switch in 1765. Next slide. The East India Company rapidly became the largest capitalist organization in the world. It developed half the London docklands. Next slide. Uh, by the uh, 1780s, it was building 700 East Indiamen a year to move its opium, its... Uh, its uh, uh, tea and its textiles around the globe. It had by this stage also in the 1780s by planting opium here, selling it illegally in China and buying Chinese tea. It had become the largest narco operator in the world. Forget the Medellin cartel, look instead to Leadenhall Street and the East India Company. Next slide. And so it's straddling the globe by 1780. Indian opium, Chinese tea, and what happens when the American Revolution breaks out is the East India Company tea here in Boston Harbor that's getting poured into the, into the sea. So it's a properly multinational corporation. And it is making tons of money. It's making tons of money, it has to be said, in collaboration with the Bengalis. The Bengalis buy into the East India Company from the beginning. Although you distinguished yourself in the 19th century as, as, as leading the opposition to the Raj, at the beginning, it was your financiers, particularly the Jagat Sets and the Marwaris, that lent the company the money to buy the mercenary army that conquered India. India was not conquered by white British troops. It was conquered by Indian sepoys paid for by Indian financiers. The trick that the East India Company pulled off was to present itself as the least worst option. And if you were a Bengali in 1750 and had a choice between the Mughals and the Marathas, for many people, the East India Company seemed a slightly safer option, particularly at a time when Calcutta was like Dubai or Singapore today, a tax-free zone where businessmen could go and make a fortune. So Marwaris came here, they made fortunes, and they paid the, for the company. There were never more than 2,000 white guys in Bengal at any point during the company period. It was the trick that they pulled off was to persuade Indian financiers to lend them money to pay for Indian warriors to fight other Indians. It's a story so improbable that if you made it in a novel or a film script, no one would believe you, but that's what happened. Plus, they also realized to make a sock Thing, the permanent settlement, which is this slightly boring sounding thing in history books, is crucially important to understand how modern Calcutta, in a sense, developed. What it was, in short, was that the old Mughal Jagirs, which were these vast, unwieldy land tracts, were split up, auctioned off in small blocks. Who buys it? The Bengali Batralog. The, the Mullocks, the Debs, the Tagores, all the North Calcutta big families. And by doing so, they buy into this project and become part of it, and protect it. 
They also buy company bonds. The company, when it wants to fight a war against the Marathas, releases high-interest bonds, which say you put in 100 rupees in, in 1790, you can take out 200 rupees in 1795. The Bengali Badrilok pay their money into this and pay for the conquest of the rest of India. Uh, and it's, it's not a pretty tale, but it's, it, it, just as the looting of the company needs to be said to the British, the collaboration, particularly here, needs to be said in Bengal, because it's only through this that the company took root. And only if you understand how anarchic India was uh, in the period post Aurangzeb do you understand why your forebears made that decision, rightly or wrongly. Next slide. And yet, amid all this collaboration, there's a great deal of cultural exchange. Here is John Wormwell, a chartered accountant from Yorkshire, the brother of the man who is paying for Lawrence Stern to write Tristram, Standy in Tristram, Strandy in Tristram Shandy in Coxworld in Yorkshire. Uh, and he, as you can see, is dressed in full Mughal pajama and fig. But it's not a one-way uh, one current, this. Next slide. Uh, and this is Ashraf Ali Khan, who's a Kashmiri saltpeter dealer who's cornered the saltpeter trade out of Patna. He is wearing, obviously, Kashmiri clothes, but he's sitting on an English chair, sitting perched up with his duties on the ground, and his hooker is resting on a Georgian depoy. Here is his girlfriend. Next slide, Mutabe, the same happening. So you've got, as well as financiers lending money to the East India Company, uh, the Badralog doing business with indigo and opium with the East India Company, you've got cultural exchange going on too. People are experimenting with their furniture, their clothes, their food, and so on. Next slide. And amid all this, you have artistic exchange. This is a picture of Mazar Ali Khan, uh, probably Mazar Ali Khan, who is one of the great Delhi artists of the 1840s. He is sitting in the Mughal position. This is how you painted if you were a Mughal artist. You sat on the ground, you leaned back against the bolster, you put one leg up, you rested a board on it, and you painted about six inches from your, uh, from your nose. But if you look at what he's painting with, you can see on the ground Mughal oyster shells, which is how the, the malachite and the lapis, these ground mineral pigments, are, are put together. But you see in his two boxes, there are English watercolors. And he's painting on English watercolor paper with English spectacles on his nose. So you have a beginning of a sort of cultural exchange at this period. And just as the company is eating into the incomes of the Murshidabad Nawabs and the big, uh, and the big Mughal Jagirdars, uh, and they have no longer have the same amount of money to spend on the arts, on dancing girls, on painters, on, on poets, and so on, so the company takes up the slack. Never the company itself, never the institution, because the company, like Goldman Sachs, is all about making a profit. It's just not interested in culture. But individual company servants, the more educated, the more erudite, the more cosmopolitan ones, do take an interest. The guys like the princeps, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, James, uh, I mean, Princeps and Princeps Gat, all, all these, the early Orientalist William Jones and so on. These guys begin to take an interest in Indian culture and they begin to employ Indian artists. Next slide. Here is a newly, a newly discovered picture of one of the major artists in the south, uh, Yalapa of Valor. He too has got both oyster shells with Mughal pigments and newly imported English watercolors. It's an incredibly strong self-portrait. This guy looking full of confidence and... Uh, how are we doing? Thank you. Let's see if this works. Uh, full of confidence, looking straight at the viewer um, with his two assistants on either side. And Mughal art already was a fusion of, uh, of European and, uh, and in, uh, Indian and Persian influences. Here is a page of Indian flower studies. And here is what they've been using, the, the Dutch engraving, which is basically, we'll go back again just so you can see how incredibly close these two are. Here is a lovely Mughal uh, inlay uh, vase uh, in the Itmadudala. Nothing more Mughal could be imagined, but then compare it with this Dutch engraving of a, a still life. Very, very similar. Um, so Mughal art has already taken in, infused, uh, tinked with, with European influence, but that increases at this period. 
And this Indian uh, tradition that exists alongside the pictures of Durbars and, uh, and uh, Nawabs and painting Maharajas and so on, you also have people like Mansour painting gorgeous natural history pictures. So th Mughal artists know brilliantly how to paint the natural world. But how do they do it? They tend to do it with a nice paradise garden in the background. This turkey is sitting in a landscape. Uh, so is this dodo. There are lovely sort of butterflies fluttering around and irises in the background, um, flowers and landscapes. But the European tradition developing in the 18th century was rather different. And uh, this is a period when Linnaeus is still alive in Sweden, beginning to name names, classify plant systems when uh, Sir Joseph Banks has just come back from his voyage to the South Seas with Captain Cook, and suddenly there's a fashion right across Europe for large folio volumes, often uh, uh, lithographs of the natural world, the, 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 the flowers of Australia, the flowers of, of New Zealand, the flowers of France, the birds of France. And the first person to realize that Mughal artists are ideally placed to contribute to this is Claude Martin in Lucknow. Claude Martin, who built the La Martinia School here in Calcutta and in, uh, in, in Lucknow, was an Enlightenment thinker. He was in touch with all the scientists and philosophers of Enlightenment France. He hears that the Montgolfier brothers have put up a hot air balloon in Lucknow. Five years later, he puts one up himself. Um, he reads scientific medical journals, and when he discovers he's got a rumbling appendix, he operates on himself using written descriptions from, from medical journals. And among the books he imports is a new book called Les Oiseaux de France, which is a book of French bird pictures. And he realizes that the brilliant artists of Lucknow, who his friend Paulier is already in touch with, here is quickly Claude Martin's house, uh, and here is Paulier on the left of the picture, um, uh, and uh, Claude Martin is in the, uh, the red jacket um, to the right. Here's Claude Martin close up with John Mumwell again, the guy we saw wearing the Mughal jama and so on. So Claude Martin commissions Lucknow artists and he shows them these lithographs of French birds against a white background minutely painted by French artists. What happens? The result is this sort of thing. The very first ones are huge, um, outsized uh, Lucknow style birds painted against a kind of Mughal landscape. There are very similar pictures of individuals, Nawabs and so on, standing in these lily-put landscapes with these tiny little trees. But the artist has now replaced it with a stalk. Then after that, it gets more European still, because they begin to take away the background. So you get Mughal artists with Mughal training painting in the style of French natural history paintings. And this is happening in, 17, in 1770. Uh, he imports 17,000 sheets of watercolor paper at this time uh, and puts a whole team of artists at work to record the flora and fauna of, uh, of Lucknow. This is a gorgeous cobra. Look at the... the um, underneath is, the, is a cross-section of the cobra's skull. Now, Mansour would have put a little butterfly or an iris there, but now with this pretension to science, you have a cross-section. The same Mughal artist with the same training, painting with the same detail, but now it sort of has a little scientific spin. And here is a newly discovered cache of Claude Martin's natural history paintings from Kew. Uh, gorgeous things. I went yesterday to the herbarium at your amazing botanic gardens, and there's 3,000 of these pictures, beautifully kept in immaculate conditions in the herbarium. Um, very well looked after and uh, a major resource for this city that should be put on display in a major exhibition. Every bit as good as this. And in fact, a lot of these ones in this show, this is incidentally a show that's currently on at the Wallace Collection, sponsored by the Delhi Art Gallery, for which many thanks if they're listening or in the crowd. Um, it, this show is mainly made up of copies made in Calcutta and sent back to Kew and to Edinburgh the other botanic gardens, while you here have the originals. So everything that I'm showing here uh, in the next few slides uh, is, is done in Calcutta uh, and, and based on, uh, on the work of the botanic gardens. So here is one of the earliest ones that survives. This is an amazing artist called Bawani Das, probably trained in Murshidabad, uh, moves with Mir Qasim to Mongir and Patna, and is brought back uh, by one of the early 
um, uh, men in the Botanic Gardens, uh, if not Kidd, then probably James Kerr. It's certainly in the Kerr album. And look how immaculately he paints these mangoes. And there are a whole series of these extraordinary pictures. Uh, the ones I'm showing are the ones in the Wallace Collection show in London. If any of you are passing through London, it's on until April. But there are equally good ones here in Calcutta. You can make an appointment at the herbarium, anyone, anyone that has an interest in these things, and you can go and see them. And they are spectacular, just the other side of the Hooghly and Hara. Uh, and of course, the company is a business, so they're interested in particularly commercial plants like coffee uh, and opium. And here we have a gorgeous opium poppy that's about to wreak havoc with the Chinese opium smoking population. Uh, you have club moss. This is by an artist called Muna Lal. Uh, Muna Lal is this extraordinary artist that does these fantastically three-dimensional images. Uh, this is a ginger root, again, one possibly of commercial options. And this is from the south. This is from um, one of the artists that uh, uh, I think it was Roxburgh brought up from... Um, from the, the Andhra coast. Now he is not, this is Rungia, he's, he's a Hindu, he's from the south, he's not trained in the Mughal style, and instead he's trained as a Kalamkari artist, he paints textiles. So look at his picture here. It is completely flat, but look how he's taken the tendrils on a dance around the picture. Um, extraordinary images of palms, efflorescence of the Kura palm, and this passion then passes to other people in, in Calcutta. This is Lady Mary Impey, married to the Chief Justice, Sir Elijah Impey. She ends up here, age 19. Her great interest is nature. So she takes Bawani Das. She calls two more artists down from Patna, Sheikh Zainuddin and Ram Das, and she begins to commission them to paint her menagerie. Now, these pictures are some of the great masterpieces of of late Mughal art. They're very much, that's the Mansour of about 1600 at the court of Jahangir, and here is a, a, an Impi uh, uh, Samba uh, in 1780 painted in Calcutta. You can see it's very much the same artistic world. This is an Impi cheetah, but the only difference is it's now against a white background and they're a bit bigger. These are about double A3 size. They're very large and very gorgeous pictures. Now they've never been shown before. Why? because neither country claims them. For, the, for Indians, they're slightly colonial. This is, has been known as company school art. It's somehow not quite Indian. Even Bian Goswami more or less leaves it out of his Masters of Indian Painting. Uh, uh, but for the British, it's, it's all a bit redolent of empire. It's all a bit embarrassing in the, in the new post-colonial world. So this stuff gets stuck and left in limbo. It's stuck in reserve collections. These things have never been exhibited, and you are seeing them now for the first time. Here again is a Mansour to compare with. Look, this is the uh, Impi, 1780, Mansour, Agra, 16, uh, about 1620. Um, this is a, a, an Impi pangolin. Looks like it's escaped from a Disney film. A wonderful, uh, the, the, the inscription in Urdu calls it a pahari chua, a mountain rat. Uh, beautiful stalks with all the delicacy of, uh, of, a, uh, uh, of a Japanese print. Cyrus Cranes. This used to belong to Jackie Kennedy, who was a great collector of company art. Um, pelicans. And this has got a whole David Attenborough nature program attached to it. There's a cocoon on the left of the picture. It hatches into a caterpillar on the left, busy nibbling a leaf. Then, the, then it hatches into a lovely moth, uh, and then the bird comes and eats it. You've got a whole sort of life cycle uh, in this picture. They're incredibly beautiful, and because no one has claimed them and no one has shown them, they've got their colors completely intact. They are, they are pristine, because they've never been taken out and they've never been shown. Um, look at the colors of this golden oriole. Incredibly gorgeous. Now, we haven't got much time, and I'm very keen to talk to my friend, Joa. Um, so I'm going to rush it. This, incidentally, is, is... First of all, Sheikh Zainuddin comes and paints the pretty animals, the cheetahs, the, the pretty birds, and so on, that Lady MP really loves. But she's so excited by this project, she gets two other assistants, Ram Das and Bawani Das, to join them. And having run out of the nice sort of pretty animals in her menagerie, they begin to paint snakes and lizards and fish. And this thing looks like it should be attached to Sigourney Weaver's face uh, in, a, in a kind of, uh, in some sci-fi movie. Uh, it is in fact just a horseshoe crab, uh, but painted as if it's some creature from a, a sci-fi nightmare. Um, 
snakes. This is Bawani Das seems to be in the, uh, the, the junior assistant. He gets given the really nasty animals like the cobras to paint. Uh, how he did it, we're not sure. Is it, I mean, are they on the ground? Is he sketching them? Are they, are they dead? I mean, I just don't know. This is my favorite one, this incredibly male bat. Um, uh, it's, it's just an animal in a colonial menagerie. Uh, but the panache with which he outstretches his wings as if he's like some Italian commendatore about to usher a woman into a Venetian opera house or, or something. With, with, you know, he's left his boxer shorts and his dinner jacket behind, but otherwise he's got all the, uh, uh, he's got all the appendages you need for the job, shall we say. Uh, anyway, here he is. here's his girlfriend, uh, and here is his mother-in-law hanging upside down somewhere. We can get her. There she is. <laughs> Lizards, again, poor old Bawani Dask gets given all the nasty, creepy crawlies to uh, catfish, pufferfish, um, flatfish, lots of Bengali fish. Um, and then Haludar is the next generation Bengali artist. We don't know his background, but he develops his own style, painting with a minute pen and ink, incredibly gorgeous work. He's employed by uh, Buchanan at the new menagerie that Lord Wellesley sets up at the newly established Barakpur weekend residence of the Viceroy, of the Governor General. And Halodar is a major new discovery. No one's written about him before. There's a wonderful essay by Melanie Roy in the catalogue in Forgotten Masters uh, of this new artist. Look at this, the essence of mousiness, uh, as if escaped from a Beatrix Potter movie or something. Um, wonderful bear that seems to have trod on an electric current and all his hairs are, uh, are standing on, uh, on, on end. And then once this takes off, other people get in on the act. This is uh, one of the great artists of, of, of Calcutta that your uh, city needs to reclaim with pride. This is Sheikh Mohammed Amir of Karia. You could probably tell me where Karia is. I'm not sure. Is it just around here? So he's a local boy, Sheikh Mohammed Amir of Karia. And this is an extraordinary picture. Um, I'm just going to end, I think, with this and, and talk to Joa. Look at this picture. The girl's face is not shown. Why? You can interpret it in a number of ways. The servants are there. You can see their characters. They get given a full humanity. But the girl is just this sort of colonial alien on a horse in her bonnet. You can't even see her hands, which are covered with gloves. Uh, and uh, why is this? Is this a Muslim artist showing respect to his patron by not showing a woman's face? Uh, is this a sort of form of colonial resistance? Is this Sheikh Mohammed Amir saying she's not quite human, this little memsab? Uh, she's just a creature in a bonnet. Uh, and unlike the servant, she's not given a face. I don't know. Just do a few more. Sheikh Mohammed Amir, as he's local here, the kind of stubs of Park Street, if you like. Amazing painter of horses. Uh, of dogs, of course, the British uh, are obsessed with their dogs. Uh, one, the, general, the, the dog on the right, uh, the boy, is called General. The girl on the left is called Aya. Uh, and uh, Sheikh Mohammed is very good. These are actual portraits. Of, they're not just pictures, they're portraits. They actually capture the character of the animals. He paints gigs. This is obviously a very strange thing to him. The strange English did. He paints the pictures of Garden Reach and the large colonial buildings of Chowringhi. Look at this hot Calcutta afternoon, unlike this nice winter day. You can see the sun baking down and the kites circling, the water reflected in the, uh, the house reflected in the pukor with the uh, adjutant stalk on the left uh, and, the, and the shutters down during the middle of the heat. And just to quickly race through some last ones, this passes on to Agra, where you get these wonderful images um, commissioned of the architecture of Agra, and then to Delhi where Ghulam Ali Khan and his family produced these astonishing images of architecture, but particularly of people. This is uh, Ustad Himat Khan, who was the kind of Keith Richards of the Mughal court, who despite being blind, managed to get one of Zafar's, the Emperor Bahadur Zafar's mistresses pregnant, as a result of which he gets banished to Hyderabad uh, and, and uh, survives the massacres of 1857 and keeps the Delhi Garana going into the 20th century. Um, these are the rather racy dancing girls of Delhi. You'd cut a dash in Housecast Village nightclub tonight uh, uh, if you were to turn up in this very revealing outfit with these wonderful bell bottoms. And this is Lalji's wonderful picture of Malagua. You get the impression. This is William Fraser's before and after picture of William Fraser's ADC called Kala. On the left, he's shown as he emerges from his, uh, his Haryanvi village in his dirty old dhoti and his sword and his scruffy old turban. 
And on the right is how he uh, appears after a good blow, joy in a sh uh, uh, blow dry and a shampoo uh, and a trip to the Oberoi um, sort of uh, 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 pedicure uh, department. Uh, and look at him, he's all sort of dressed up in his, in his wonderful sort of Napoleonic outfit with a strangely shavite hat. And uh, interestingly, William Fraser, who commissioned this, was a great fan of Napoleon. And when he heard that Napoleon had no reading matter in St. Helena, he unilaterally sent his entire reading matter to Napoleon in, uh, in St. Helena, and it sank on the way. But the news that he'd done this reached Napoleon, who was very touched by this, this gesture from a young officer in India, and sent to Delhi his signet ring and one of his last possessions, which was a bust of himself by Canova. And amazingly, unlike Fraser's library, which sank, the bust of Canova reached Delhi and was a decoration in, in Fraser's house, passed on to Thomas Metcalfe. And in 1857, when Thomas Metcalfe's house uh, was burnt down, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the statue disappeared and was found in 1858 being worshipped in a Shiva temple as an image of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of Lord Shiva. Uh, which is probably as good a point to end as any. Uh, uh, any I, I, where it is now, though, sadly, whether it's in Yogi Aditya Nath's uh, headquarters or something otherwise is not known. But thank you very much. <laughs>
where we don't have depth, we don't have perspective, where you don't have size, you don't have, you have the same pastel background. So there are three schools basically. But Vidhi, I must tell you something that uh, many of you don't know. One of the finest collections he referred to was the Impe collection. So Elijah Impe, Chief Justice of the Calcutta uh, Supreme Court at that time, Elijah Impe is famous not only for his judgments on Clive and company, on, on Hastings and Kamde, Nanda Kumar's uh, hanging. He is more famous for us for building the first menagerie in known India, in Calcutta at least. It was a zoo, and that zoo was housed in a park, and that park stretched from the fort. The fort point ends on Chorangi and went all the way up to burial ground. You know the three burial grounds? And that huge park has left behind only one small slice, Elijah Impey's park, this Allen Park. This is a little slice of that huge park that was there for which you named it Park Street. So that cheetah once ranged in this. It was. It was. Uh, cheetahs were uh, were domesticated. You know, che cheetahs were very much uh, part of these. So, so this little Allen Park is a tiny, forgotten slice of a huge thing, and the glorious name Park Street would come later. It had the most inglorious name called Burial Ground. Road. All along, they became, uh, when they ran out of space in St. John's uh, churchyard, they used to take them all there. Now, so this is where, now Elijah Impe employed, as uh, William, put, uh, William put it very well, Zainuddin, uh, Bhagwan, uh, Bhavani Das, and Ram Das. These were the paintings that, I mean, we can focus on them. In addition to that, we had another brilliant person whom we have forgotten is uh, this uh, Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad, Amir. Muhammad Amir of Karaya. He always writes Karaya. Karaya because Park wasn't there. Park, Park Circus. Karaya is part of Park Circus. So you have in the same place four incredibly accurate artists. I mean, I'm putting and, it in And some, some people, there's a Calcutta tradition which is not backed up by any facts, but could easily be true that Sheikh Muhammad Amir of Karaya was from the same family as Zainuddin. And if it is the same um, area, that makes sense. But they were no. basically, they were kalm, Kalamkaris who'd come in from Murshidabad, the, yeah. the Muslim ones. And the two Hindus, that is Bhavani and uh, Ram, they were, I believe, from the Patna office. Because Patna, Patna had a good school of art. But anyway. Patna uh, Kalam. Patna Kalam. Yeah. That's it. So we have, we are sitting today on a piece of Very incredible nice. history. <laughs> Allen <laughs> Park. I don't know why it was a serendipitous choice. But this is the last part. We must work on that great park of Calcutta that housed every sort of, every type of animal or bird that you could think of. And gradually it started getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Until, okay, is there any telltale mark left? Well, one telltale mark left is the entrance to Elijah Mpe's house, which is known as Middleton Row next to Fleury's, Middleton Row, and the church that he had there is still there as part of Loreto. Loreto Com. It was taken over by, he, he was a Protestant yeah. and Loreto's Catholic, so we have all those <laughs> BGP, uh, TMC things there, but we'll let that pass. But these are the vestiges. Now, uh, uh, this is what I made sense out, uh, made the, uh, wrapped up what he's tried to say. We really need to focus on these forms of art, at least the two indigenous. There have been so many exhibitions, I have done them in Victoria Memorial as well, of the European school, of Daniels, Hodges, Hedges, we, uh, Timmy, uh, Tilly Kettle, the whole works. We are very familiar with these names. What about the Indians who were pushed into anonymity and have done Equally good work. That's a single point. Here. May I congratulate you and the Wallace Collection. And the Wallace Collection who sponsored it all. He's got five or six or best experts on this subject. In fact, Losty's uh, one on uh, the Marquis of Hastings and his journey from Bengal to Punjab. Sitaram. Was done, the, 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 uh, the one he did on Sitaram. 
Now, Lostius discovered Sitaram. So, Sitaram is very much a part of our history today. So, this way, we need to reclaim. That's the point, I guess. The, I think, important point is that the, we don't actually use the phrase in this exhibition or this catalogue, company painting. It's Mildred Archer's uh, phrase, which she'd borrowed from. It, they said, company kalam in Patna, and she, and she took it on. But I think, it, for exactly this reason, that it, in a sense, it gives privilege to the European patrons over the actual Indian painters. So what we've done is to divide this catalog and, and the actual show itself into five rooms and celebrate the five groups of artists. Uh, and so we don't, we don't do it by the patron, we do it by the artist. So Sheikh Zainuddin, Ram Das, Bawani Das, the next room, uh, we have the, 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 um, the wonderful natural history painters. So uh, Govindu, Rangia, uh, and, and the other guys working in the, uh, in the Botanic Gardens. The next room, Yalapa and uh, right. Sheikh Mohammed Amir. Mohammed. And finally, the Delhi and Agra artists, Sheikh uh, 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 Ghulam Ali Khan, Mazhar Ali Khan, uh, uh, and so on. So we're trying to, uh, belatedly, these guys that have been forgotten, partly because it's seen not to be Indian enough. And uh. the one thing I would disagree with you, dear Joao, is that I don't think the, these company paintings look European. They're certainly the white backgrounds are very uh, un uh, we, We'll have it over a drink. <laughs> uh, th this is too dry of a discussion. One, for those who are interested, apart from the book that I insist you have a look, the Marg's, Marg, you've heard of Marg, M-A-R-G, the art journal has brought out a special issue exactly on the same subject, focusing on the botanical art of Indians. Indians were made to copy botanical specimens because this was part of commerce. They needed to have photographs of where to exploit, what to exploit. Nothing was done due to philanthropy. Philanthropy and others uh, are passing. Mm -hmm. So if you come across this Marg issue of December this year, you'll find a continuation. I think they had sort of read each other's mind. You'll get the Roxburgh collection. You'll get the Wallich collection. You'll get the Impe collection, all the famous collections. It's time Calcutta owned up these collections and anytime and you, you and want you have a lot in the in the victoria memorial you and have a lot, lot in the victoria. botanic garden that's so it you, you have great collections in the city neither of which are on permanent display <laughs> anything else yeah. any questions oh. we Round up. right we got five minutes for questions right. gentlemen in the dark glasses so my question is my question is so in your presentation, you said that uh, this beautiful school of uh, art, which uh, Sir said the company school of painting, neither Europeans nor Indians claim the ancestry heritage of this. Both of, both of the community discarded it. My question is, now you are in India since 1986, I believe, and you have done a profound research on Indian history and other things. Apart from this school of painting, what are the other beautiful byproduct of that era on which neither Indians nor Europeans still now has claimed their heritage ancestry. Well, I think the I think the, Ang the Anglo Indians. <laughs> Anglo Indians, right? I was, I was a little hesitant of saying very, that, but Anglo Indian a is very one. real, a very real byproduct, uh, yes. and who were a very considerable presence in this city until the 20th century. Um, no, I mean I think as as, as Joa said, the, um, the the whole European story of art in this, uh, in, the, in this country, Hodges, Tilly Kettle, and so on. I mean, it's very interesting that the, the best collection of their work in the world is not in, in London, it's here. It's in the Victoria Memorial. Uh, it's a spectacular, and the, and, the, um, and the stuff which was on display in Britain has been taken down and, and, and either put in storage or sent to provincial museums. For example, the most popular painting in in the Tate Gallery in the 19th century was, uh, was, uh, uh, was the famous picture of the retreat from Kabul, Dr. Bryden on his pony coming down the Khyber Pass uh, with the, uh, on this n old nag. That was the most famous picture in the Tate in the 19th century. In 1960, in the aftermath of empire, when the British had shoved the whole of empire into a trunk and put it in the attic, Dr. Bryden gets sent off to a regimental museum in provincial Somerset. So no one sees this stuff anymore except here. So, so, uh, and, and here, of course, it's, you know, it's, it's problematic in its own way. Um, so, uh, 
I, I don't know how many centuries it's going to take before both uh, sides can look at it just as a work of art rather than the representative of a period of, 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 of darkness, and uh, as Shashi would call it. Just one addenda, because we've got to end up now, is that it has been, this problem has been recognized, and about last 15 years, there's some amount of work. That's where I started speaking from. And when, uh, when um, the, what's a, your former prime minister who was here? Uh, no, no. When the, uh, when the new prime minister took over charge in Britain, the first thing he did in 2010 was Cameron. He brought a team here. And we signed an agreement exactly on this, that we do a digital unification. We don't need to sort of handle every object. We need to see them. So there are about 25,000 objects in Victoria and Albert, in British Museum, in Oxford, and in British Library. This, this stuff that he talks, I mean, the, both, all the three streams. And we have around estimated 30,000 of them in Victoria Memorial, in NGMA, in Chhatrapati Shivaji or Prince of Wales Museum, in Hyderabad, and uh, a bit in Patna and other places. So we needed a digital unification of something that may have been painted by anyone, but the subject is India. Subject is India. And I tried to explain to that government and to this one that has, of course, uh, taken the franchise of India, uh, but no, no one seemed to understand. So we, uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank uh, William on behalf of all of you. And he's a star. Thank you very much. And so well, I have one question for both of you. The question is: Did you guys plan to wear the same color? <laughs> it's just a coincidence. I hope. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.